Hello, welcome back to our channel. Today I'm excited to bring you an American sci-fi series, Constellation, which premiered in February 2024. An astronaut narrowly escapes from the International Space Station and returns to Earth, only to find that familiar people and things have changed in eerie ways. Is this a time travel situation or has an alien force intruded? Let's find out. The story begins with the female protagonist, Johanna, driving down a rural road with her daughter. The radio is playing static noises. Johanna tries to reassure her daughter that everything is normal. They soon arrive at a small cabin in the woods. After unpacking, Johanna quickly hides a strange metal canister outside. Suddenly, she hears her daughter calling from afar, even though the child is supposed to be asleep inside the cabin. Johanna senses something is wrong and heads towards the distant sound. Flashback five weeks earlier, Johanna is still aboard the International Space Station. She tells her daughter Alice via video call that she will return to Earth in 84 days. Today, they have a special mission to test a newly discovered substance that only remains active in zero gravity. As the experiment begins, a loud explosion rocks the station. The pressure starts to drop rapidly a metal rod flies through the air and impales Commander Paul's arm. The ground control issues an emergency alert about a loss of pressure and orders all astronauts to enter the escape pod and evacuate. Johanna's module has stabilized and she sees a colleague trapped in a fire in the hallway. She grabs a fire extinguisher, clears a path, rescues her colleague, and then shuts the burning module's door. The crew counts heads and Paul's condition is the worst. With his arm severed, he falls into a coma, making Johanna the acting commander. She and a doctor stay behind to provide emergency care while the others assess the damage to the station. The bad news keeps coming. The station's power and life support systems are damaged. Escape Pod 1 has a power system failure, but Pod 2 is operational and has only three seats. On the ground, Caldera, the project lead, reviews the experiment data from just before the accident and is astonished. He gives a shocking order. The astronauts must repair the space station and continue the experiment no matter what. Johanna received the order and had to open the hatch, put on her spacesuit, and head outside to make repairs. Upon reaching the damaged part of the station, she finds severe damage to the power system and external cables, making it impossible to reconnect without specialized equipment. The command center immediately orders all astronauts to return to Earth ignoring the project lead's protests. As the sun rises above the horizon, it lights up the space station. Using the light, Johanna discovers a 50-centimeter crack on the station's outer shell. Could this crack be the result of the recent accident? Johanna adjusts her position to investigate further. As she pushes aside some cables, a horrifying sight appears. The hitting object is the body of an astronaut. Shocked, Johanna loses her balance but luckily, her safety rope keeps her from drifting into space with the body. Back inside the module, Johanna receives more bad news. Paul has died from blood loss. Only four astronauts remain, but Escape Pod 2 only has room for three. Everyone is uneasy, as no one wants to stay behind. Then Johanna decides to stay and repair Escape Pod 1, while the other three take Pod 2 back to Earth. The command center approves this plan, because the life support system on the station can only sustain one person for 19 hours. The three crew members board Pod 2, and the separation sequence begins. Johanna feels deep sadness as her colleagues drift away, wishing she could be on the pod to reunite with her family. Meanwhile, Johanna's husband and daughter are heading on a plane to the Space Command Center. Paul's daughter is also on the plane. They all hope to reunite with their loved ones returning to Earth. Johanna is doing everything she can to make this reunion possible. The power system of the Escape Pod 1 is damaged and needs a complete battery replacement. As time passes, the command center finally receives good news. Escape Pod 2 successfully enters the atmosphere and lands safely with all three crew members unharmed. This is incredibly uplifting news. Now all eyes are on Johanna. However, Johanna isn't focusing on the power repair. Instead, she goes to the lounge to retrieve a bracelet necklace from her daughter. She can lose anything but this necklace. Just as Johanna finishes replacing half of the batteries, the command center issues a new task. She needs to retrieve the new substance and experimental tools from the lab. 
Caldera, the lab head, had previously asked Pod 2 to bring these items back to Earth, but the command center head blocked this order, believing the accident might be related to the new substance experiment. Caldera, furious, scolds the command center for not understanding the importance of the data, which could change the world. The command center head, unsure what to do, reluctantly gives Johanna the retrieval order. Johanna hesitates, uncertain if she'll have time to get to the lab after finishing the battery replacement. At this point, Johanna's husband and daughter finally arrive at the command center. Just as they are about to communicate, the signal suddenly cuts off. Panicked, Johanna notices the emergency lights in other modules starting to go out, indicating that backup power is running low. She pushes aside her worries and speeds up the repair work. In the quiet module, a noise suddenly echoes and she follows it to the source. Upon reaching the lab, the surroundings unexpectedly change. Johanna finds herself inside a building. She curiously explores until she reaches the end of a corridor and sees the necklace her daughter gave her. When she turns around, the surroundings return to the space module. Alice's call pulls Johanna back to reality. She continues to follow the sound and soon arrives in front of a wooden cabin. Curiously, she looks around and notices the snowflakes floating in the air, slowing the world down. Johanna pushes open the door and is shocked to find the interior almost identical to her cabin. As she explores further, she again sees her daughter's necklace at the end of the hallway. Opening the door, she finds another Alice standing there. Without thinking, Johanna grabs her daughter and heads back to her cabin. Alice, weakened by the cold, needs to warm up quickly. Johanna frantically starts a fire and heats water, trying to warm Alice. As she puts Alice in the bathtub, Johanna suddenly remembers another Alice lying in the room. Confused, she sees the two identical daughters and wonders what's happening. When she looks back, Alice in the bathtub has disappeared, and Alice, sleeping in the room, wakes up from the commotion. Johanna smells Alice's hair and considers the girl in front of her is not her daughter. Suddenly, the scene changes, and Johanna wakes up back in the space station. Looking at her watch, she realizes she has been unconscious for several hours. Could it be from low blood oxygen levels? With time running out, Johanna speeds up the repairs. Suddenly, a white cloth floats by. She shines her flashlight and doesn't know when Paul's body opens its eyes. Feeling uneasy, Johanna musters the courage to close his eyes and cover his head with the cloth. The silence around her is eerie, so Johanna decides to record a message for her daughter to fend off her fear. She hears a raspy voice outside the module, but when she stops recording, the voice disappears. Playing the recording back, she hears the raspy male voice. Johanna shines her flashlight and searches outside the module again, spotting a hand floating in the air through the window. Opening the hatch, she finds Paul's severed arm. Johanna can't tell if this is a supernatural event or a hallucination from lack of oxygen. She focuses on replacing the batteries. With only 90 minutes left, the escape pod's power is finally restored. As Johanna prepares to start the separation sequence, she realizes the pod hasn't received the latest return orbit parameters due to a communication outage. This is like the autopilot's route planning. Without it, the pod might land in a densely populated city center. Luckily, Johanna's skills are top-notch. She manually calculates the latest orbit parameters using the parameters from pod 2 and the current time. With some time to spare, Johanna remembers the command center's task and rushes to the lab to retrieve the new substance and equipment. After entering the parameters, she has done all she can, leaving the rest to fate. She records all the messages she wants to send her daughter and locks the hatch. Without hesitation, she starts the separation sequence, but suddenly, a warning light comes on. Consulting the manual, Johanna discovers it's a bolt system failure that requires two people to fix it manually. Feeling a chill down her spine, she fears she might die here. But to her surprise, the bolt fault fixes itself. As the escape pod slowly detaches from the space station, Johanna stares in disbelief as she sees a figure standing inside the retreating main cabin. As the escape pod nears Earth's atmosphere, a staged separation begins and plummets toward the ground like a comet. The command center captures the signal immediately but realizes that Johanna is using a ballistic landing method, making it difficult 
to predict the landing site. At that moment, Johanna receives a signal from the command center and struggles to open the communication button. When the command center hears Johanna's voice, they erupt in celebration, but the tracking signal is lost again as the pod accelerates. The command center quickly dispatches a search team as they can only estimate the landing area. Soon, the pod descends to a safe altitude, with the parachute acting like a giant hand to hold it securely. With a loud bang, Johanna finally lands successfully. After an unknown amount of time, Johanna wakes from her unconscious state. Opening the pod door, she greedily breathes in the long mist air. However, a wild wolf enters her field of vision, causing Johanna to freeze in fear. Just as the wolf seems about to pounce, a gunshot rings out from the distance. It's the rescue team. A large number of medical and armed personnel surround Johanna, and she is protected until she sees her husband and daughter, feeling that all her efforts were worth it. Unfortunately, Paul's family is not as fortunate. They only receive the cold bodies of their loved ones. Caldera, however, is most concerned with the special substance. He eagerly activates the equipment to review the experimental data, but doesn't find that the equipment's contents emit a strange glow again. Johanna is contentedly watching her daughter. Unexpectedly, Alice is the only one left on the helicopter at the next moment. She stands up and looks around, discovering that the world has become empty. Johanna, sitting in her seat, experiences something similar. Fortunately, when she looks again, her daughter reappears, though her expression is somewhat vacant. When Johanna speaks in Dutch, Alice seems not to understand, leaving Johanna unsure of who is at fault. Seeing Johanna lying stiffly in the examination equipment, Alice starts to think that her mother might be dead. At the next day's press conference, reporters incessantly question the cause of the space accident. Just as Johanna is about to answer, Frederick aside interrupts, stating that the joint investigation is incomplete and no further details can be provided. Johanna wants to end everything here as soon as possible and enjoy life with her family. But the Joint Space Station Command insists that Johanna must stay at the space base until the cause of the accident is clarified. Amidst various efforts, a grand accident investigation hearing is formally launched with all four surviving astronauts present. The investigation team leader, Irene, who was the commander of the previous space evacuation, and is affiliated with the Russian Space Agency, dismisses Johanna's claim that the object striking the space station was a 1960s Soviet female astronaut's corpse. She logically concludes that a corpse could not float in space among debris for decades, and the joint agency has never received reports of astronauts dying or going missing in the area. She believes the supposed female corpse is a hallucination caused by Johanna's oxygen deprivation. Both sides refuse to concede, as confirming the object as the Soviet female corpse would place significant responsibility for the accident in Russia. After the hearing is paused, Johanna returns to her dormitory to eat and notices that her husband's hairstyle has changed, which she likes. Her husband seems uncomfortable, as Johanna has never complimented him this way before. That night, Johanna, with her daughter's help, attempts to go to the bathroom but accidentally falls halfway. Alice goes to find her father for assistance. When Johanna turns around, she discovers that the corridor has transformed into the one she encountered on the space station, with the wooden door of the camera also hanging with a bracelet. Even when her husband arrives to help her up, the eerie corridor remains unchanged. Meanwhile, at the space research base, Caldera confidently explains to his assistant that the particular substance can produce dual quantum signals upon impact, but it is challenging to record. He wants to conduct another experiment at the base. However, after an entire afternoon, the particular substance shows no change. Holding nearly blank data, the assistant advises Caldera to stop wasting his efforts, but Caldera insists he is correct. When the equipment was retrieved yesterday, he did indeed detect dual quantum states just like the data from the space capsule's laboratory. The stubborn old man ignores the assistant's doubtful looks and continues to monitor the equipment. Just before midnight, the mysterious dual quantum signal finally appears. Caldera tries to record it with his phone, but finds that the video cannot capture it. Instead, he takes paper and pencil to sketch the dual quantum shape. The next day, 
Caldera excitedly shows the sketch to his assistant and only gets the assistant to comment. Your drawing skills are quite good. Caldera leaves the laboratory dejectedly, not noticing that the particular substance in the equipment begins to flicker again. At this moment, his attention is drawn to a strange occurrence downstairs. A little girl in black clothing runs into the garage, followed by another girl of similar size carrying a toy rabbit. It turns out that Johanna's daughter, Alice, plays hide-and-seek with the deceased Paul's daughter, Wendy. While hiding under a wheel, Alice accidentally sees her friend stomping on her beloved doll. Alice quickly runs out to stop her, only to find Wendy and the doll have disappeared. She runs outside to confront Wendy, who thinks Alice is trying to reclaim her doll. When Wendy picks up the toy and sees no dirt on it, she wonders if she sees things. Caldera then approaches and starts talking about quantum physics, sensing something unusual and wanting to give Alice an introductory lesson. He explains that classical physics theories cannot explain many phenomena. For example, the same object can exist in two different states simultaneously. The toy rabbit might appear white in one world and gray in another. There is a critical space between these worlds where the color of the rabbit can switch between white and gray. Alice listens, partially understanding, unaware that Caldera's experiment with the particular substance is intended to simulate a critical space where things can exist in two different states. Johanna faces a second hearing. This time, Irene presents more convincing evidence. Based on Johanna's description of the astronaut's appearance, Irene found a space debris bag from the 1970s that closely resembles the one Johanna mistook for a corpse due to her stress. Johanna is left speechless. After the meeting, Frederick comforts Johanna, claiming he has always been on her side. He then tries to caress Johanna's face, but she recoils in resistance. Frederick is taken aback and surprised by Johanna's reaction. Johanna and three other astronauts prepare to pay their respects to the deceased Paul the following day. Johanna is still convinced she did not see things incorrectly and even finds photos of astronauts in the same suit online. Her short-haired colleague points out that the astronaut in the images is the head of the investigation team, Irene. Johanna is left speechless with shock. After paying respects to Paul, Johanna plans to stay behind alone to ponder the situation. However, as soon as she stands up, she sees the deceased Paul appear before her, but when she looks again, he has vanished. During the following hearing, Johanna straightforwardly admits to Irene's theory saying she saw a space debris bag because she is eager to leave. Back at home, Johanna finds everything familiar yet somewhat off, and she is curious about when her husband changed their car, as the car at home was previously red. Her husband looks confused momentarily and says the car has always been blue. On the other side, Irene knocks on Caldera's dorm room door. It turns out that not only are they colleagues, but they also have a close personal relationship from their past space missions. Hearing that Irene is terminally ill with cancer, Caldera decides to cherish their remaining time together. However, as their conversation deepens, Irene transforms into a mummified corpse. At the same time, on a cruise ship somewhere in international waters, another Caldera is being questioned by a detective who is investigating him. The detective claims that Caldera during a space incident 30 years ago, might have caused the death of two colleagues. The old man's anger flares up, pushing the detective into the sea. This concludes the first three episodes of Constellation. Many of the mysteries in the story should have been unraveled at this point. According to the dual quantum theory, Johanna's return journey encountered a bolt malfunction, indicating that she must have died in one parallel world. The Johanna who returned to Earth is actually from a second parallel world, with the consciousness of both worlds somehow merged. The Black Commander Paul might not have died in the second world and even helped Johanna fix the bolt so she could return to Earth. The corpse Johanna encountered in space is another world's Irene, and the person Alice saw destroying the doll is also from another world. Caldera had already figured this out clearly. Interestingly, in the other world, his counterpart had even killed the detective in that world. Additionally, Johanna's marriage in the first parallel world has deteriorated, and she might have ended up with the handsome Frederick. In contrast, 
Johanna remains faithful to her husband in the second parallel world. This is why there are discrepancies in their memories, including the red and blue cars. Johanna, who has never played the piano, instinctively moves her fingers over the keys upon seeing a music sheet. To understand this, we must go back a few days. After returning safely from space, Johanna finds the once familiar world now strange, with discrepancies in her family, colleagues, and even the car's color. Her husband and daughter are preparing a belated birthday party for her. During a question game, Johanna mentions her name in Swedish, causing the atmosphere to freeze as her husband and daughter have never heard of it. Johanna clearly remembers mentioning her name multiple times and that her daughter could speak a few Swedish words. Her husband, Magnus, is perplexed and confronts Johanna about why she seems different after returning from space. Their relationship has become strained and he is even prepared for divorce. Johanna insists it is impossible. She has always wanted to be with her husband. Despite this, Magnus remains cold. Johanna begins to question whether her memory has been disturbed. She inspects every detail of the house and finds a piano in the living room that she doesn't remember anyone playing. Johanna decides to confront her husband, but Magnus immediately criticizes her, claiming she has lost affection for the family, and even if she hadn't gone to space, he would have taken their daughter to the cabin alone on weekends. Friends have spread rumors about Johanna having an affair with Frederick. Magnus is determined to confront her, hoping she will admit to it. Johanna can hardly believe her ears. She has never had any romantic involvement with her colleagues and only loves her husband and daughter. However, Magnus refuses to believe her and leaves to find their daughter. Johanna is fully aware of the seriousness of the situation and immediately seeks help from a psychologist. She describes her husband's and daughter's changes in attitude and her memory discrepancies, which are causing her significant distress. However, the doctor insists that Johanna is suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, due to the life-threatening crisis she faced on the space station. Many high-risk professionals, including soldiers, suffer from this condition, which can later lead to mood swings and loss of control. The doctor prescribes a box of antidepressants to help alleviate her stress response. Johanna takes the medication with reluctance as she fears that such psychiatric drugs might dull her senses and jeopardize her ability to continue as an astronaut. After leaving the medical office, Johanna puts on her uniform and returns to the space agency, where her colleagues warmly welcome her back as a brave astronaut. Only Caldera, the experiment leader, watches her with a conflicted expression. He reflects on a space death incident from decades ago as if harboring a significant secret. Soon after, the space agency delivers unfortunate news. Caldera's dual quantum entanglement experiment, which has not progressed, will be suspended. Caldera falls into a deep silence, unable to speak. Before long, Caldera approached Johanna and invited her to the laboratory under the pretext of a breakthrough in the experiment. During their conversation, he casually asks if she encountered anything unusual in space. Seeing Johanna deep in thought, he shares a strange occurrence from years ago. A colleague's son had died, and during a space test flight, the colleague nearly experienced an accident, only for a child's voice to warn him. The colleague confirmed that the voice came from his own child. Caldera has heard many similar stories and encourages Johanna to recall her experiences more carefully. As she examines the experimental data, her mind flashes back to the scenes from space. After leaving the company, Johanna picks up her daughter from school. The kindergarten teacher informs her that Alice has been behaving very withdrawn, possibly due to the family environment. Johanna notices the teacher exchanging glances with Magnus and upon returning home, questions her husband about his relationship with the teacher. Magnus denies it, claiming Johanna is overly sensitive. When Johanna gets home, she discovers that Alice is missing. While searching, she finds a familiar bracelet on the cabinet door and discovers Alice hiding inside the cabinet. Alice explains that she likes to hide in the wardrobe from time to time. Johanna is concerned and surprised, remembering Alice as very outgoing, not the introverted child she seems to have become. After Alice falls asleep, Johanna approaches the unfamiliar piano. As her hands instinctively move over the keys, a clear melody begins. 
Johanna is horrified to realize that she can skillfully play an entire piece of music through muscle memory, which contradicts her previous inability to play the piano. Johanna comes to the unsettling realization that she is indeed ill. She decides to take the antidepressants, but finds the pills strangely familiar. She remembers that the nutritionist repeatedly advised her to take vitamins during her rehabilitation training at the base after returning from space. Johanna discovers that the vitamins from the base are identical to the antidepressants. She returns to the company's laboratory to verify whether they are the same medication. Analysis confirms that the base's vitamins are dementia-inducing antidepressants. In disbelief, Johanna searches the medical records and finds that several astronauts had been prescribed this medication after returning from space and reporting seeing things that should not exist. As Johanna is in the room, two staff members arrive to deliver goods but seem oblivious to her presence. She shouts in frustration and the delivery personnel disappear when the room darkens again. Feeling panicked, Johanna decides she cannot stay there any longer. Walking through the hallway, she finds Caldera still in his office, talking to another version of himself on the screen. He suddenly turns and warns Johanna, curiosity can be deadly. The scene shifts and Frederick suddenly walks into Johanna's office. He believes it's time for them to have a serious discussion. He reminds Johanna that they had planned to leave the space agency together to be together forever. Johanna, however, is in a daze and is no longer sure if her memories can be trusted. Johanna is invited to give a speech at her daughter's school in the afternoon. She once again sees her husband and the teacher in a seemingly intimate conversation, which causes her to lose her temper in front of the children, making them laugh loudly and making Alice feel even more inferior. On the way home, Johanna plays music on her phone against her mother's wishes. The music triggers a vision of the space station, nearly causing Johanna to have a car accident. Upon returning home, Johanna finds Frederick has shown up uninvited. He confronts Magnus directly, stating he wants to leave with Johanna together. Johanna is shocked and speechless as she doesn't remember having any affair with Frederick. Magnus feels embarrassed and furious, questioning Johanna's refusal to admit the truth. Frederick adds fuel to the fire, suggesting that Johanna might be mentally unstable. Before leaving, Frederick warns Magnus to call him immediately if Johanna shows extreme behavior. Enraged by the scene, Magnus storms out, leaving Johanna feeling that her life is falling apart. Frustratedly, she notices a package on the table containing two tapes from the space station's joint team. One of the tapes contains Johanna's recorded voice from the space station. When Johanna plays it, she first hears a raspy male voice, followed by her message. The other tape contains a message from 1967, just before a female astronaut's death, starting with the same raspy male voice. At this moment, Alice is awakened by the noise and discovers that the living room downstairs is hosting a memorial for her mother. Suddenly, another Alice turns to look at her, but these images disappear soon. Seeing her daughter frightened, Magnus instinctively hides her in the wardrobe. Johanna disagrees with this action, but Magnus feels Johanna's reaction is too extreme, as this was their usual practice. Magnus thinks Johanna needs medication, but she believes that someone is conspiring to force her to take psychiatric drugs to cover up what she saw in space. Magnus picks up the phone, intending to call Frederick. Johanna, furious, pushes Magnus to the ground, leaving him motionless. This concludes the fourth episode of Constellation. By the end of this episode, it becomes clear that Johanna, affected by the experimental substance, has crossed over from Parallel World 2 to Parallel World 1, where she is dead. The mechanism behind this was explained in the previous video. Johanna in Parallel World 2 is a devoted wife, as seen from the photos in the space station. Her daughter's cheerful and lively nature contrasts with Alice's withdrawn and extreme behavior in Parallel World 1, where Johanna has an affair with Frederick and neglects her family. This explains the strange behavior of her husband and daughter after her crossover. The crossover most likely happened during the space station explosion. If we closely examine the first episode's opening scene, we see that Johanna and her daughter's video call co-occur in two parallel worlds. At the start, the little girl has two braids and Johanna's spacesuit marking is on her left hand. 
However, when passing by the experimental instruments, the little girl has no braids and the spacesuit marking is on her right hand. The explosion might have caused an overlap between the parallel worlds, leading to Johanna's accidental crossover. Many other details support this, though they are not listed here. In the fifth episode of Constellation, the story picks up with Johanna accidentally knocking her husband, Magnus, unconscious. Although Magnus is unconscious, his phone has already dialed Frederick. Johanna quickly hung up the call and dialed emergency services, providing them with the situation and her home address. She hastily gathers her things, preparing to leave. Johanna suspects the space agency might be out to get her, possibly to cover up what she saw in space, the corpse. This suspicion is compounded by the strange tapes she received, which contain recordings of her conversations from the space station. Johanna clearly remembers that communications with the command base were cut off then. To uncover the truth, Johanna returns to the space agency, hoping to access archived records of the communications. However, her access permissions are too limited, and she can only retrieve recordings related to the quantum entanglement experiment before the collision. Thinking quickly, Johanna heads to the lab, removes the experimental equipment, and decides to investigate it thoroughly, regardless of its connection to the accident. The next priority is to escape the city with her daughter. While dining at a restaurant, Johanna asks Alice why she likes to hide in the wardrobe, as Johanna has no recollection of this habit. Alice responds that she is scared because a woman often says strange things, which makes her want to hide. Johanna attributes this to Alice's imagination and suggests drawing the woman to confront her fears. Johanna then uses a public phone to call the person who sent the tapes. However, the call abruptly ends when she wants to visit them. Curious about the sender, Johanna finds online news about the individual, who had previously served six months in prison for falsifying recordings. Johanna is disoriented and insists that the tape content is genuine as she spoke those words on the space station. Calming herself, Johanna decides to call Magnus to check on his condition but Alice shows her the drawing of the person she saw in her hallucination, which turns out to be the astronaut's corpse. Johanna is shocked, as she never mentioned this to Alice. Facing a series of bizarre events, Johanna resolves to investigate everything. She visits the home of the tape sender, where a well-dressed elderly woman explains that her brother, who hung up on Johanna, is an amateur astronomer. They intercepted a space transmission using old equipment, but the official stance was that the command base never received it. The siblings recorded these ghost transmissions and were sued by the space agency, ending up in prison. Hearing about Johanna's sighting of the astronaut's corpse, which the agency denied, the woman and her brother sent Johanna the tapes. These tapes, recorded by the elderly woman using vintage equipment, contained the space station's conversations that were never received by the command base. In a photograph on the table, Johanna recognizes a young caldera who had previously visited the elderly woman's home to retrieve Apollo 18 recordings. Johanna recalls that caldera was the sole survivor of an accident at the space agency and his life changed drastically afterward. The elderly woman suddenly hushes Johanna, revealing that she and her brother have been under surveillance by the space agency. She tells Johanna that she must accompany her on a sea trip to learn the truth. As their small boat sets sail, the woman explains they need to travel eight nautical miles to a place that acts as a junction between two spaces, where they can capture sounds typically inaudible. She then plays a tape containing recordings of a female astronaut's final moments from 1967. After a burst of static, the woman's voice is heard. The elderly woman had previously discovered that only one female astronaut, Irene from Russia, was supposed to have launched that day, though she safely returned to Earth. The identity of the deceased astronaut remains a mystery. Seeing Johanna deep in thought, the woman inserts another tape, shockingly featuring Paul's voice. Johanna is horrified, asserting that Paul died on the space station. The elderly woman spoke sternly, saying, To date, 500 people have been to space. Many of them were diagnosed with mental disorders upon their return. However, they were all top talents who underwent rigorous training and scrutiny. It is inconceivable that they could collapse mentally so easily. 
Clearly, someone is covering something up. There must be something wrong with outer space. Recent events deeply shake Johanna, and she needs time to process everything. Before parting ways, the elderly woman gives her several ghost tapes. Johanna wants to refuse, but ends up accepting them. Meanwhile, the lab head, Caldera, is unaware that his experimental material has been stolen. He receives a call from Irene, who mentions a recent report where a Nobel Prize-winning physicist discussed the critical point of quantum mechanics. When two or more particles are entangled, a change in one particle affects the state of the other. Caldera, pondering this, returns to the lab only to find the experimental equipment missing. He is overwhelmed with agitation and immediately calls Irene for help. Caldera tries to calm himself by washing his face, but he hears the sound of his voice on the phone. A casually dressed Caldera is talking on the phone in another parallel world. Could the two worlds be overlapping again? The formally dressed Caldera writes, Don't bother me, on the steamed up mirror, which the casually dressed Caldera can see. Despite his irritation, the call ends. In the meantime, the formally dressed Caldera seeks out Frederick, intending to join the search for Johanna, believing she may have taken the new experimental equipment. However, since the funding for the quantum entanglement experiment has been withdrawn, the theft is not of much concern. Caldera suddenly notices his pants are soaked and insists on joining the search. Frederick reluctantly agrees. Caldera storms into the bathroom, fuming, and greets himself in the mirror. The casually dressed Caldera appears and mentions wanting revenge because the formally dressed Caldera had sent the entanglement equipment to the space station, causing chaos. The officially dressed Caldera retorts that the other Caldera could not follow through, to which the casually dressed Caldera sarcastically asks if he has wet his pants. Meanwhile, Johanna is preparing to take her daughter to a vacation cabin in the woods. Overwhelmed with questions, she let Alice play the ghost tapes. To her surprise, the sound is much clearer than before. Johanna becomes intrigued by the peculiarities of the experimental equipment, as it can make the voice clear. Alice points left when they reach a fork in the road, but Johanna doesn't remember a fork there. After navigating icy roads around a lake, they finally reach the cabin. After Alice falls asleep, Johanna plays a ghost tape, which records their conversation before the crash, followed by an explosion. Johanna turns off the player, but Alice, having woken up, comments that the girl in the recording isn't her because she doesn't speak Swedish and never calls Johanna mom. This concludes the fifth episode of Constellation. By this point, the plot is becoming more evident. In the first episode, Johanna rushed to the cabin with her daughter Alice and encountered another Alice, likely due to the experimental equipment causing a spatial overlap. Since Johanna from the parallel world one has died at the space station, this world's Alice reacts differently upon seeing her mother. The conversation at the end of this episode confirms this. Johanna is astonished not only by the existence of another self, but also by the tape's final recording. It appears that Johanna died in the crash, while Paul, who was supposed to be dead, is unharmed. This likely happened in another parallel world. Johanna slowly understands the truth, while Caldera knows more about the situation. He can even communicate with his counterpart in the parallel world. If either one stops taking medication, their overlap will be more pronounced, which might be why the space agency wants Johanna to take the drugs. It's shocking that what seemed like mere fantasies were actual events. Now, let's begin the content of Episode 6. We return to the moments before the space station explosion. Paul is performing the final adjustments on the quantum entanglement experiment. Johanna, chatting with her daughter, is unaware of the imminent danger. Suddenly, all communications are cut off and the space station begins to shake violently. Johanna, unsteady, crashes into the viewing glass. When things calm down, Paul follows the floating blood to find Johanna embedded in the glass. Due to the pressure differential, blood is continuously spilling out of her head. He quickly uses a tissue to seal the hole in the cracking gloss and retrieves Johanna's body. Magnus receives the news of his wife's death and rushes to the space agency with their daughter. On the way, they meet Wendy, who comforts Alice and assures her that everything will be okay. Now the story is happening in the parallel world too. In parallel world one, Johanna returned to Earth, 
but Paul perished. To comfort Wendy, Alice even gives her a beloved doll. In these coexisting worlds, it is unexpected that events take very different paths. In Parallel World 2, the surviving Paul is puzzled by the sudden disappearance of the experimental equipment on the table after the explosion. He has no time to think more. He and Johanna from the other world make the same decision to stay behind and let the others return to Earth first. Eventually, the strange events repeat, but the roles are reversed. Paul hears noises in the escape pod, and while changing the battery, notices Johanna's headpiece floating. He goes over to secure it and even listens closely. He repeatedly thinks Johanna might still be alive as he can hear the living sounds of her speaking. Anxious, he consults the command center. With Johanna's severe injuries, returning to Earth from zero gravity would cause massive bleeding. Before he can get a response, Paul moves Johanna's body out of the escape pod, planning to leave her on the space station forever. Just before letting go, he apologizes, feeling a force in his palm. When he looks back, there is no sign of any anomaly. Was it just an illusion? Meanwhile, Magnus finds Alice hiding in the closet. Concerned about her being there at night, Magnus is surprised when Alice, in a sudden change of demeanor, ignores his warnings and closes the closet door. After Magnus leaves, Alice sees a shadowy figure of her mother. When she opens the door, there is nothing there. This mirrors Johanna's earlier experience and suggests the quantum experiment has caused a world overlap. The next day, while Alice and her friend play outside, Wendy's mother calls out, informing them that Paul is returning. Alice's mood darkens as she realizes her mother will also be back, though only as a cold corpse. Magnus then brings the bad news that Johanna's body may remain in space forever. Having replaced the power system, Paul prepares to return to Earth in the escape pod. He faces a bolt malfunction that requires two people to repair. After some mindless banging, the malfunction surprisingly resolves on its own. Paul looks in disbelief at the space station, where he seems to see a figure at the observation window. Upon safely returning to Earth, Paul is warmly welcomed by family and friends, but feels an eerie sense of unreality. The teammates who were alive just days ago now only exist as tombstones. As Paul places his flowers and looks up, he briefly sees Johanna's figure, only to vanish again. He does not realize this is due to the overlapping worlds, thinking it is a hallucination. Facing Johanna's family, Paul explains he was forced to leave her on the space station and describes Johanna's horrific injuries. This causes Alice's face to change dramatically, and Magnus quickly pulls her away, as the description will make Alice sadder. Deeply troubled, Alice heads to the parking lot and violently stomps on her cherished doll until Wendy stops her. Alice seems ungrateful and instead starts to scratch off the doll's eyes. Paul is increasingly troubled by strange hallucinations that make him question reality. During a review meeting about the quantum entanglement experiment, everyone, including his astronaut colleagues, insists that the space station did not experiment. Surveillance footage confirms this, and the investigation committee states that Paul's decision to leave Johanna's body on the space station was unilateral. The space agency's command center did not issue any such directive. This leaves Paul more bewildered than ever. He searches online for information about past space missions and finds a video of a failed moon landing years ago where only an astronaut named Caldera survived. Paul is shocked because he clearly remembers that the moon landing was successful. Despite a mid-mission failure that cost two astronauts their lives, Caldera heroically ensured the mission's success. Paul rushes to the space agency to meet Professor Caldera, the initiator of the quantum entanglement experiment. However, the receptionist incredulously informs him that Caldera, disheartened by the failed moon landing, left the space agency years ago and had nothing to do with the experiment. Paul is further astonished because he remembers speaking with Caldera before the space station explosion. Despite their arguments, they can't resolve anything. However, they are unaware that Paul's symptoms are similar to Johanna's. His body is in one world, but his memories belong to another. This is likely the result of the experimental equipment causing the overlap between the two worlds, possibly linked to their deaths. Realizing something is wrong, Paul begins to reassess his life. He notices that his references to his wife and daughter seem to unsettle them, 
and he can't tolerate their small habits. He suspects that something inexplicable happened on the space station. Similarly, Alice is feeling lost and angry. She tears up the gift meant to celebrate her mother's return and suddenly hears piano music from the corner of the hall, even though her home has no piano. Magnus, seeing the mess and the impact of Johanna's death on Alice, seeks help from a psychologist. The psychologist suggests holding a funeral for Johanna to help Alice cope with her grief. Magnus follows this advice and sets up a memorial at home. However, Alice hides in the closet, refusing to come out. She questions why they should say goodbye to Air if her mother is still in space. Magnus reluctantly goes to greet the guests. Standing at the door, Paul hesitates to enter, feeling guilty for leaving Johanna's body in space. He is convinced Johanna is still alive. Seeing his distracted father, Wendy pulls Alice over and tells her that just now, Paul says he believes Johanna is still alive. Alice turns and sees another version of herself. Paul collapses in shock as seeing Johanna. Johanna's appearance makes Alice shout out loud. After the guests leave, Magnus suggests a getaway to relieve Alice's stress, and she immediately wants to go to the forest cabin where her mother often visits. Meanwhile, Paul's wife wakes up to find her husband missing and contacts the space agency. The colleague she speaks to informs her that many returning astronauts suffer from stress disorders and often experience bizarre phenomena. She advises Paul's wife to prepare for the possibility that even if they find Paul, he might be suspended from duty. Unbeknownst to them, Paul has arrived at Caldera's residence. In this world, Caldera lives in a nondescript apartment. To Paul's surprise, he does not recognize him. In Paul's memory, Caldera was his mentor at the space agency. When Paul recounts Caldera's successful moon landing, Caldera's expression darkens, realizing that Paul is referring to another world's version of himself. Caldera pulls out a gun from his drawer when he sees Paul intends to investigate further. Meanwhile, Magnus and Alice are on their way to the forest cabin. Magnus finds the road blocked by ice at a three-way intersection and suggests staying at a hotel in town. However, Alice insists on reaching the cabin that night, even if it means trekking across the ice. With no choice, Magnus heads to the cabin with his daughter. They skillfully open the door, and Alice reflects on a wall painting as this was her mother's favorite. Magnus, moved by the scene, begins to cry. Obviously, their relationship is good, and Alice comforts her father, believing her mother will return. Late at night, Alice sees lights outside and upon looking out the window, spots Johanna slowly walking from the car. This concludes episode six, which tells the story occurring in Parallel World 2. It shifts the perspective from Johanna to Paul. For some reason, the two worlds overlap in the same way. Now let's dive into the exciting content of episode seven. Alice looks through the window and sees her deceased mother. Without putting on a coat, she rushes into the icy landscape but her mother and the car have disappeared. Sure, she hasn't hallucinated it. Alice puts on a coat and wishes to head out a little far to investigate. She doesn't yet understand the marvel of quantum entanglement. The sight of her mother was due to a brief overlap between the two parallel worlds. Johanna in Parallel World 1 has just arrived at the cabin. She had stolen the space agency's quantum entanglement equipment, intending to bring her daughter there to avoid trouble. However, before she even enters the cabin, she hears someone calling out, Mom. Her daughter is right next to her, so Johanna is perplexed. The mother and daughter enter the cabin and listen repeatedly to the ghost tape. The tape contains voice chats between Alice and her mother before the space station accident. Alice is sure the voice on the tape isn't hers because she never speaks Swedish. Johanna was also shocked to hear Alice mention that her mother had introduced the experiment equipment during a video call. Johanna is sure the space station never conducted quantum entanglement experiments. Paul's body is in parallel world two, but his memories are stuck in world one. Thus, at the hearing, he insists he was conducting the quantum entanglement experiment, while the jury says it was canceled years ago. After listening to all the ghostly tapes, Johanna and Alice start to piece together the truth about the parallel worlds. One tape reveals Paul asking the command center whether to leave Johanna's body in the space capsule. Alice expresses her long-held belief that the Johanna before her isn't her real mother. 
Although it's a harsh truth, Johanna agrees and decides to uncover it. While storing the experimental equipment outside, Johanna hears her daughter calling again. She runs back to the room in disbelief, but finds Alice asleep. Could someone else be calling her? Johanna, her eyes bright with hope, grabs a lantern and heads towards the sound. Unfortunately, Alice, calling for her mother from Parallel World 2, doesn't encounter Johanna on the way. Soon, Alice in World 2 sees lights in front of the cabin. Confused by the identical house and the key in its usual place, she opens the door to find the interior almost identical to her own cabin. She searches but sees no sign of her mother. Alice hides in the upstairs closet. As a strong wind blows the closet door shut, Alice panics and repeatedly knocks on the door, calling for her mother. Johanna suddenly hears the calls and turns around, spotting the lights of the nearby cabin. Soon, the closet door opens and Alice sees her mother standing there. Johanna is equally excited and trembling, quickly bringing Alice back to her cabin. She carefully smells Alice's hair to confirm she is her real daughter. Johanna prepares a bath for Alice, but discovers another Alice lying in bed. Feeling dizzy, Johanna is shocked to find the bathwater gone and only the newly awakened Alice in front of her. She is convinced that what she experienced wasn't a hallucination and tells Alice there is another cabin on the other side of the woods. She must find her daughter. Confused, Alice asks why she isn't Johanna's daughter. Seeing her mother leave in a hurry, Alice follows her. Meanwhile, Alice in World 2 doesn't realize that the overlapping space has separated. After calling for her mother, she notices the bathwater has disappeared. She quickly wraps herself in a towel and exits the room, encountering her newly awakened father. Alice tells Magnus she saw her mother, but he dismisses it as a delusion caused by her longing. Not wanting to elaborate further, Alice waits until her father falls asleep and leaves the room again. She is sure there is another cabin across the forest, and her mother must be there. At the same time, Johanna is walking in the snow with Alice from World 1. This Alice believes the cabin her mother saw doesn't exist and thinks it's just a shared hallucination experienced by astronauts. After reuniting with Alice from World 2, Johanna is sure that Alice in front of her isn't her real daughter. The little girl quickly asks, if she isn't her mother, then who is she? Alice in frustration, throws the equipment into the snow. Alice decides to return home to find her father, but on the way, comes across another small cabin. Curious, she enters and finds the interior almost identical to her home. She sees a tape recorder on the table and following her habit, hides in the upstairs closet. In Parallel World 2, Alice accidentally finds a bead in the snow. After walking a few steps further, she discovers Johanna's dropped experimental equipment. Assuming her mother is nearby, she quickens her pace and soon arrives at an abandoned cabin. Upon opening the door, she sees a living calico cat, unlike the dead one in World 1. Alice opens the closet and finds a tape recorder inside. When she presses play, she hears Alice's voice from World 1. It turns out that Alice from World 1 is also in a closet, using a similar tape recorder to record her voice. Despite being in different parallel spaces, they communicate across worlds through the tape recorder. Not long after, Johanna arrives at the cabin. She hears noises from the closet, but finds nothing when she opens it, only a tape recorder playing World One Alice's voice. Johanna realizes her daughter must have returned to their cabin and quickly grabs the tape recorder, starting the car. However, she doesn't notice that a lamp she left on the table has been knocked over by the wind and ignited the wooden floor. Johanna is suddenly emotionally overwhelmed as the tape recorder plays the conversation between the two Alices. They are in different worlds, but see each other through mirrors and discuss their experiences, including the car's color at home. They now confirm that parallel worlds do indeed exist. Johanna notices a glow in the distance behind her and realizes the old cabin is on fire. When she turns the car around and speeds back, the burning house has transformed into her own cabin. She rushes inside, only to find the house has reverted to the abandoned cabin. The painting on the wall is now ablaze. The calico cat is dead, and a black cat roams around. Johanna rushes upstairs and finds Alice from World 1 hiding in the closet. It is puzzling that Johanna can hear Alice from World 2 through the tape recorder, but her voice cannot be transmitted back, 
only relayed through Alice from World 1. Johanna vows to reunite with Alice from World 2. As the fire breaks through the painting and smoke fills the upstairs, the closet mirror shatters and flames spread. Johanna grabs Alice and runs outside. Meanwhile, Magnus and Space Agency colleagues head towards the cabin in the woods. However, the road is blocked by snow, forcing them to continue on foot. Caldera, the head of the experiment, seems to sense something and walks in another direction. By chance, he finds the experimental equipment thrown by Alice from World 1. The flames ahead catch his attention, and Paul's questions echo in his mind, making him realize these events are happening in parallel World 2. With a gunshot, the two calderas from the worlds are simultaneously shocked and their consciousnesses swap. Johanna hands Alice over to Caldera, who unexpectedly leaves her in the snow, as Caldera from World 2 has resigned from the space agency and doesn't recognize Johanna's daughter. On the other hand, Caldera from World 1 is responsible and immediately calls for medical help upon seeing Paul injured. Johanna enters the burning house, but does not find Alice from World 2. When she comes out, she sees Alice, whom she gave to Caldera, lying alone in the snow. The temperature is so low that the girl is barely alive. Johanna immediately begins first aid. At that moment, Alice from World 2 appears behind her, asking to go home with her. Johanna makes a rational choice, knowing she cannot leave Alice unconscious here. Magnus's voice is heard from afar. Johanna urgently tells Alice from World 2 to return to her father as a group of space agency personnel rushes over. The intertwined spaces separate again. Alice from World 2 reunites with her father. Johanna saves Alice from World 1, however, her true daughter is missing. The scene shifts to Alice from World 1, lying in a hospital bed. She dreams of an astronaut's corpse, telling her it will take her to meet her real mother. She wakes up startled and asks her father where Johanna is. Her father explains that Irene has taken Johanna. Alice is alarmed and insists on rescuing Johanna. This concludes Episode 7. At this point, it's essential to clarify a few details. There is only one cabin in the woods, but it exists in different parallel worlds. The so-called other cabin in World 1 is simply a result of the cognitive distortion caused by the overlap of parallel worlds. Carefully examining their paths reveals they all involve walking a certain distance and then turning back. The cabin locations should be consistent. In the previous episode, Johanna, who had seen two daughters simultaneously, was taken away by rescuers. After a long journey, Johanna is forcibly brought to a suburban monastery. Irene, the head of the Russian space agency, coldly watches as several nurses attach electrodes to Johanna's head. Meanwhile, Caldera, who has woken up in the snow, picks up the neglected device. His mood darkens as he raises an axe and strikes the device, causing a sound of shattering. Johanna, in the monastery, falls into a deep sleep. Eventually, Johanna wakes up in the unfamiliar environment and feels an unexplained panic, primarily upon discovering that the door is locked from the outside. When the door finally opens, Irene calmly enters, advising Johanna to relax and play a tune on the piano. Johanna is too preoccupied with her daughter in the cabin to think of such leisure. Irene reassures Johanna that her daughter Alice has just recovered and is waiting at home. Johanna shakes her head, claiming that the person is not her daughter and accusing them of hiding the truth. The medication she was given is proof. Irene patiently explained that Johanna was found to be pregnant at the recovery center, so she received different medication. Johanna is stunned, pushes the pills away, and hears a low, mournful sound from the ceiling. Irene grimly mentions that there is an incurable patient upstairs. Johanna steals herself and begins to recount a recording from another world, where Irene's counterpart died in a space station accident in another world. Irene's expression changes drastically, and she hastily exits the room. Meanwhile, at home, Alice seriously tells her father that her real mother is dead and the current Johanna is from another world. Magnus is skeptical of such an absurd claim. The next morning, during breakfast, Alice insists on visiting the monastery to see Johanna. In Parallel World 2, where Paul is still alive, Caldera is escorted to an interrogation room by police officers for having shot Paul the previous day. He firmly denies having harmed anyone, but cannot explain that his consciousness had swapped with another world's Caldera, who is now in Johanna's world. 
To clear his name, he suggests using a lie detector. Meanwhile, Caldera, in Parallel World 1, is enjoying his life, starkly contrasting to his previous struggles in World 2. He falsely accuses Johanna of destroying the equipment, blaming the space travel for her mental issues. At this moment, Caldera receives a call from Irene, requesting an urgent meeting. They arrange to meet at a restaurant. Caldera is pleased to see Irene, a legendary figure he admired, as the second woman to go to space in his previous world. However, his expression soon turns cold as he realizes that the Irene before him is similar to his situation, physically in World 1, but with consciousness belonging to World 2. Caldera hopes everything will remain as it is and requests Irene to continue hiding the truth, which is also why he sabotages the Atom device. In the monastery, Johanna unexpectedly encounters an old acquaintance at the space station. She thinks the colleague understands her situation, but the colleague, now cold and indifferent, informs Johanna that she has developed a common astronaut condition, suspicion and paranoia about her surroundings. Johanna must comply with treatment, and he will soon take Irene's place at the space agency. Angered, Johanna slams the door and tells the colleague to leave. Before leaving, the colleague discreetly hands Johanna two door keys. That night, Johanna uses one of the keys to unlock her door. As she is about to leave, she recalls the strange sounds she heard during the day. Quietly, she sneaks up to the second floor. She finds a closed door at a corner and, driven by curiosity, opens the window to see an old man with a face full of stubble. Terrified, Johanna rushes back to her room, realizing that even if she manages to escape, she will likely be caught and returned soon. Irene is pleased with Johanna's reaction, explaining that the old man upstairs is the first man to travel to space, but he suffers from severe stress disorder. Johanna understands that if she does not comply with treatment, she will end up lonely in the monastery. Meanwhile, Alice is in a closet, chatting with Paul's daughter. Alice talks about how Johanna is not her real mother. Paul's daughter expresses envy, as Alice at least has someone resembling her mother, whereas she will never see her father again. In World 2, Alice envies the safety of her friend's father. After ending the video call, both Alice's exit their respective closets. Alice from World 1 asks her father when they will visit Johanna and grabs a radio from a box. Alice from World 2 prepares to move away from this place of sadness. While packing, she sees a similar radio in the corner and tentatively presses a button, hoping to talk to her mother in World 1. Although Alice in World 1 hears the request, she does not respond, as she has realized the truth from her friend's words. Having an unfamiliar mother nearby is still better than nothing. Eventually, Alice from World 2 accepts that her mother chose to stay with the other Alice and did not follow her. She promises her father that she will no longer mention her deceased mother. Now sitting at an unfamiliar piano, Johanna instinctively plays a beautiful melody. She feels like a traveler stranded in a foreign land, yearning for home yet feeling helpless. Just then, Irene enters the room. With a calm expression, Johanna asks if Irene is dead and if there are two Irenes in the world. She confides that her situation is identical to Irene's. Irene does not deny this and explains that knowing this truth will not change Johanna's situation. Their conversation is interrupted by a commotion outside. Magnus has arrived with Alice. The mother and daughter meet in the backyard and have an honest discussion. Alice shows maturity beyond her years, suggesting that since one person needs a daughter and the other requires a mother, they should try to act as mother and daughter. Accepting reality does not mean they must forget the other loved one. Johanna feels a cloud lift from her heart. If even a child can understand this, why has she been so conflicted? Perhaps it's time to say goodbye to the past and embrace a new life. Both Magnuses are pleased with this transition, hoping their daughter or wife will return to normal and stop being unsettled. Alice and Johanna have achieved this, and both Magnuses finally get the life they wanted. In contrast, Caldera, who crossed to World 2, is worse. At the police station, he calmly answers all questions after the lie detector test, repeatedly insisting that he did not shoot Paul. The results show that Caldera did not lie, but the officers think this is just his subjective view of his innocence. The collected fingerprint evidence is objective, and Caldera also faces another charge, 
murdering a detective who was investigating him on a cruise. The poor old man becomes a scapegoat. In World One, the original instigator, Caldera, proudly walks the streets. He finds the detective who had been investigating him in World Two, but in World One, they have no connection. Caldera hugs him warmly, leaving the detective standing there, confused. Irene genuinely feels Johanna's confusion and suffering as she prepares to step down from her position at the space agency. She publicly reveals her crimes online, admitting she was forced to cover up significant truths about space travel. Some phenomena witnessed by astronauts upon their return were natural, but were obscured by various excuses. Meanwhile, in a hospital in World 2, Paul suddenly wakes up from his bed, visibly excited as if he has been resurrected. In space, Johanna's body, which had been drifting for a long time, suddenly awakens, clutching a photo from her life. The final scene suggests that Johanna and Paul have returned to their true selves in their respective worlds. Caldera's destruction of the atomic instruments did not completely sever the connection between the two parallel worlds, but restored their alternating consciousness to their previous states. This concludes the first season of Constellation, Thanks for watching our recap. If you enjoy this video, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to keep up with our exciting movie journeys. Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments and join us next time.